True Crime Brewery contains disturbing content related to real life crimes. Medical information is opinion based on facts of a crime and should not be interpreted as medical advice or treatment. Listener discretion is advised. Welcome to True Crime Brewery. I'm Jill. And I'm Dick. The disappearance of Scottish mother of two, Arlene Fraser, in April of 1998, alarmed her loved ones and set off rumors and theories throughout her community. After all, she'd waved goodbye to her children as they went off to school one morning, and she was never seen again. It was as if she had vanished into thin air. But of course she hadn't. Join us at the quiet end for From Missing to Murdered, Arlene Fraser. When Arlene didn't return home, her husband Nat told everyone that she had been drinking to excess, using drugs, and sleeping around with other men. Therefore, she must have run off with one of her lovers. Now some believed him, but those familiar with Arlene and her husband's relationship didn't. Then things became complicated. It came to light that Arlene had recently visited a solicitor about divorcing her husband, but Nat had an ironclad alibi. Had Arlene been unhappy enough to leave behind her children and start over somewhere else? Or had Nat hired someone to make her disappear? Let's discuss this really interesting case. And we have a Scottish beer for you. This is called Skull Splitter, which is one of my favorite names for beers. Brewed by Orkney Brewery in Orkney, Scotland. And it is an uh, underappreciated to me style of beer. It's a Scotch ale also known as a wee heavy. That's 8.3% alcohol by volume. This beer is just a delight if you're into that kind of beer. It's brown, some red highlights, small head. Had a nice malty aroma as well as some peat. So you get some bread and peat, sweetness, smokiness. Wonderful beer. Really nice mouthful. All right. I just love that name, wee heavy. It's cute. You like that? Yeah, probably even better with a Scottish accent. Yeah, I wasn't even going to attempt that. No, but if we have a Scottish listener who would like to call and leave a voicemail pronouncing it for us, I would love that. Yeah, let's see. You never know. All right, well, let's open it up. Okay. All right, Dickie, down here at the quiet end where the stockings are hung with care. And I don't believe we've done a Scottish case in quite a while. Maybe we've done one or two in the whole time we've been doing these, this podcast. I, I know we've done one because I found uh, another Scottish beer. Oh, do you know what the case was? No, but I, I know we've done one. Okay. Well, why don't you start us off talking about it? There's a lot to talk about. Of course, it's sad that she went missing, but then there are so many details surrounding the case and investigation. There's well, a lot to talk about. There sure is. So let's begin. Arlene McInnes, that's her maiden name, met her future husband, Nathaniel Fraser, in 1985. Born in Elgin, Scotland in 1965, Arlene had grown into an independent and rebellious young woman. Uh, I think rebellious is maybe even uh, not as much as she was. Apparently, she was kind of a pain in the ass. <laughs> well, sure, a lot of teenagers are. They sure are. Most people thought Arlene was very attractive, but she had deep insecurities that she likely hid beneath her outspoken and sometimes belligerent personality. Some young men were intimidated or put off by Arlene's confrontational attitude. Some of her friends and family even told Arlene that she should try to be more agreeable and act more like a lady. Oh, I bet that went over well. I'm sure it did. <laughs> now, at school, Arlene had not done well. Her teachers all agreed that this wasn't because she wasn't smart enough. In fact, she was very bright. But she didn't have the enthusiasm or the focus or the desire for her studies. And then to further add to her difficulties, Arlene was constantly compared in a negative light to her older sister, Carol. Carol was one of those women who just seemed to succeed in everything she tried to do. Well, and that can make it tough for the younger kids, for sure. Oh, absolutely. By 1985, Carol was married and living in Erskine, just outside Glasgow, with her husband, Stephen. Arlene stayed in Elgin with her father, Hector, after her parents separated, and she was working in a clothing store in town. 
on New Year's Eve 1985, which they call Hogmanay. Not sure about the pronunciation there. Sorry about that. But that's what they call New Year's Eve in Scotland and parts of Northern England as well. So Arlene and her friends were ready to celebrate that night with the traditions of drinking too much and dancing their butts off. Arlene was slender, blonde, and dressed in the popular style of Madonna. So the <laughs> hair was teased up. She had the bracelets. Yeah. I saw a picture. So she was super cute. Oh, that 80s stuff. Yeah. Yep. She's in my generation there. So that night, Arlene spent time with 26-year-old Nathaniel Fraser, who went by Nat. The two had met before at other parties, but they just seemed to really hit it off that evening. So Fraser was muscular, handsome, and he was a partner in a successful fruit and vegetable business in town. He was also the guitarist in a popular local band called the Minesweepers, and he was a player for the Elgin rugby team. He was upbeat, he was popular, and he was very confident. Yeah, he had more money than most guys his age because of his business partnership and because he was always up for making extra cash as a jack-of-all-trades. So it sounds like he was... Uh, Hustling around, trying to trying to make as much money as he could. Yes. Now, he did have a tendency to get into fistfights after a few drinks, but that wasn't very unusual in Elgin in the 1980s. Let's go out and get pissed and get into a fight. Yeah. Alcohol-enhanced <laughs> violence was tolerated in Scottish men, and even to a certain degree expected. So this guy is an athletic and macho guy. Fraser is very popular with the women of Elgin. Prior to getting involved with Arlene, he had seemed to prefer docile, compliant women. Arlene was considered feisty, but something about her had intrigued him and moved him to fall in love with her. Yeah, so the relationship was very passionate from the beginning, but things would kind of die away over time. But after that first night, an intense romantic relationship developed between Arlene and Nat Fraser. Before Arlene, Fraser had always moved on from girl to girl, often overlapping the relationships. And to most people who knew him well, he seemed to see women as possessions for him to use and then just discard as he pleased. But at least in the beginning, he seemed genuinely taken with Arlene. And Arlene was completely swept off her feet by Fraser. He showered her with attention and gifts. Now, despite this, many of her friends warned her to stay away from him, including her older sister, Carol but she didn't take very kindly to Carol giving her advice. No. He was not to be trusted, these people told her, and he would never be faithful to one woman. But too infatuated to take this advice, Arlene spent more and more of her free time with him. Then, just four months into the relationship, she moved in with him at his bungalow, which was located a few blocks south of downtown. And after Arlene moved in with him, Fraser continued making daily fruit and vegetable deliveries around Elgin and the surrounding area. Arlene continued to work in the clothing store in the center of town. Now, the two of them lived together without any major problems until September 1986, and that's when they announced that they would be getting married in May of 87. Fraser gave Arlene a gorgeous sapphire engagement ring. They planned a large formal wedding and reception and invited all of their friends and family. Fraser's business partner, Ian Taylor, agreed to be Fraser's best man. Later on in that same year, 1986, Arlene found out that she was pregnant. Now, it seemed to be a welcome surprise as they were getting along well and already planning to marry. And I presume already planning to having children at some point. I think that was in mind, but this probably came a little sooner than expected. Yeah. That's my interpretation. Well, you know, those things happen. They certainly do. But things weren't all smooth sailing for the couple in that time leading up to their wedding. Just two weeks before the wedding date, Arlene heard her future husband making a phone call, and she believed that he was making a date to see another woman. So she's upset, of course, and she told her father and sister what was going on. But Fraser adamantly denied this. This call caused such an argument that Arlene stormed out of their home and moved back in with her father. She was considering calling off the wedding and wondered, maybe everyone who had warned her about Fraser had been right after all. But there were some factors that made her kind of give in, and one of them, of course, was that she was already pregnant with his child. So she decided that leaving Fraser would have been very difficult. And, of course, he apologized. 
He swore to her that she was mistaken. He'd never made a date with another woman. But anyway, you know, just in case he had, he promised that it would never happen again. (laughs) So if someone tells you they didn't do something, but then they say, besides, I won't do it again, you have to question that. Then he's done it. Absolutely. But Arlene, you know, she was young. She was pregnant. She returned to him and agreed to move forward with their wedding. You also would have to think that she's kind of an impetuous young woman, right? Well, yeah. And uh, maybe when she moved out or moved back to her father's house, she immediately had second thoughts and said, well, I'm going to marry this man. Well, things might have not been great just living with her dad either. That's true. And this guy did have a home and he had more money than most people his age. Yeah. And he apologized. So, I mean, we certainly can't blame her. It happens all the time with older women as well. Yes, it does. So on the evening before their wedding, Frazier, Ian Taylor, and a group of their friends went out on the town for his stag night, or bachelor party as we would call it here. They all had a lot to drink and were having fun when Frazier got into a brawl. Afterwards, no one there was able to remember who was involved or what had even provoked the fight. But no one was super surprised or distressed about it either. After all, it wasn't the first time that Fraser had been involved in an argument that had come to blows. It was actually fairly commonplace. Right. You've, you've mentioned that. The, uh, nothing like a good fight when you're out drinking. Yes. That seemed to be the way it went. But that's a little alarming when you're marrying someone like that, I would think. <laughs> yeah, well, yeah, I Where guess. Where does he draw the line on his violence? Uh-huh. You would hope that... Uh, Marriage would settle him down. Yeah, I'm sure that's what she hoped. So Arlene showed up at the church the next day in a white Rolls Royce. She wore a white satin bridal gown with a lace-edged veil. Everyone agreed that she was a beautiful bride. Now, Fraser wore his wedding kilt, but also had two black eyes and a swollen and bruised nose. Now, everyone agreed that he looked terrible. Somehow, undoubtedly nursing a severe hangover, Fraser got through the exchange of vows and rings without any issues. He gave Arlene a golden diamond wedding band, and by the time of the reception that evening, Fraser seemed completely recovered and even entertained his guests by playing Eric Clapton's Wonderful Tonight with his band, The Minesweepers. So you can kind of get the idea there that he likes attention. Right. Yeah, he likes people to be looking his way. So three months after the wedding, Arlene gave birth to a son who they named Jamie. She and Fraser both seemed really happy, but inside of their relationship, there were many issues. One issue was Fraser's insistence on continuing to play with his band. He already worked long hours every day, six days a week for the fruit and vegetable business, but he also continued to play guitar with the Minesweepers. And not just once in a while, but all the time. On most weekends, the band played at parties and weddings and he would often be out until the wee hours of the morning. There were rumors in town that Fraser was seeing other women, but of course he denied this to Arlene. Arlene was very concerned that they were already growing apart, so much so that she begged him to stay at home with her and Jamie, but no dice. Yeah, he refused to stay home for even one weekend. He said he had to continue to play with the band because they needed the money. He said that he wanted to provide for his family, and he was still building up the fruit and vegetable business. So the uh, band income was pretty necessary, at least according to him. According to him. Now, over time, Arlene began to feel isolated and lonely. She had given up her job at the shop in town when they married, but being at home with Jamie meant that she didn't see her friends that much either. Now, that was fine with Fraser, who actually preferred for his wife to be home alone with her child. Red flag. <laughs> Yes, those are just flapping in the wind here. Despite his overnight absences and the widespread rumors of his infidelity, he was very jealous of Arlene. He didn't approve of her ever going out with her friends. On the infrequent evenings when she was able to meet with him, he criticized her for what she was wearing, or she had too much makeup, or she looked like a whore, that kind of stuff. Terrible. So that's abuse right there. And of course, this wasn't good. Arlene gradually began to lose touch with her friends, and she was spending most of her time at home with her child, Jamie. And that's stimulating conversation with a newborn. That can drive you crazy. Yeah. So a lot of people believe that Arlene had made a poor choice by marrying Nat Fraser. 
He was a womanizer who seemed incapable of dedicating himself to her. He controlled the household and he controlled Arlene as much as he could. And now as a stay-at-home mom, Arlene had withdrawn from her friends. He was in control of the money and she was dependent on him for an allowance. So that's just the way he wanted it, it seems. Yeah, like you said, the, the red flags are flying all over the place here. Yes, they really are. So increasingly lonely and isolated, Arlene was flattered by the attention of a young delivery driver who worked for her husband. They ended up having an affair, which was a slap in the face to Fraser. Arlene was his possession, and the idea of her being with another man was an insult to his already overgrown ego. To the public, Fraser seemed like a cheery guy who liked to joke around. But at home with Arlene, he was controlling and overbearing. He had no trust for Arlene, and he began to follow her whenever she left the house. And as they had more disagreements, Fraser became physically abusive. And then in 1990, things went from bad to worse. Yes, Arlene came home after a night out with friends to find him up waiting for her. For some reason, he was convinced that she had been with another man. He ripped her clothes off, slapped and punched her around, and then kicked her in the stomach as she lay crying on the floor. Arlene was frightened enough that she ran away to a woman's shelter and she stayed there for 10 days, of course taking Jamie with her. She even contacted a lawyer and she asked about filing for divorce. But again, Fraser was able to win her back by apologizing and telling her how much he loved her. Now he also can add to the guilt of saying, well, your son deserves to be with his father. So he'd lost his temper, he said, only because he loved her so much that he couldn't stand the thought of her being with another man. He promised it would never happen again. He sent her flowers, jewelry, and romantic cards. He went all out. And eventually she gave in. She left the shelter and agreed to move back home. You know, this is going to be a recurring theme. He's going to beat her or mistreat her or whatever. She'll think about divorcing him. He'll swear that he loves her and it'll never happen again. He'll ply her with gifts. And you just keep repeating that process. Yeah, it's almost a cliche how often this happens. But is. that is how it works. And that's how it worked here. And then in 1992, Arlene gave birth to their second child, a girl named Natalie. But the marriage was still very problematic. The main issue was always Fraser's jealousy and philandering. Arlene still loved spending time with her friends, and she wasn't willing to give that up completely. So there were more and more arguments, many of which became physical. So between 1992 and 1997, things became so bad that Arlene went back to see a solicitor three more times. Each time she told her that she'd decided to divorce Fraser, But she ended up changing her mind when he apologized and promised to change. So like you said, it was a pattern. Then in 1995, he gave Arlene a gold eternity ring as part of making up. Around the same time, Arlene was diagnosed with Crohn's disease, which is a painful and debilitating inflammatory bowel disease. It's a horrible disease. Now, can stress make that worse? Oh, That's absolutely. what I was reading. Yeah. Yeah. So it's incurable and really can have life-threatening complications. Well, it can. You can get some really nasty infections. And you can get abscesses and fistulas between the bowel and the bladder. It's just nasty stuff. Nasty, and it sounds really painful and miserable. It can be. She did get on medication to help her keep it under control, but the stress of these frequent fights caused the disease to flare up, and she lost a lot of weight. People were worried about how thin she became. Then in 1997, Arlene enrolled in a part-time two-year business studies course in Elgin. She wanted to learn skills in order to become financially independent. Up until then, Nat had brought all the money into the house and had given Arlene an allowance. She had made no money of her own since she had left her job in the clothes shop, and that was before the, her son was born. Arlene recognized that controlling the money was a way for Fraser to control her. So she was determined to become independent so she didn't have to rely on him. Yeah, and he was very aware why she was doing that, and oh, of sure. course he didn't approve of that. So any chance he got, he would try and sabotage her. But between his fits of violence, he was charming and nice to her. He worked hard all week, but he still went out every weekend, and he still slept with other women. 
He was actually a predator who beat on Arlene emotionally and physically and saw her as his property. He didn't really care about her, but in his mind, she definitely belonged to him. So when she started to try and break out of his control and find some solace in her friends, he felt more threatened and more angry, and the violence escalated. It's just a bad situation all around. Uh-huh. Arlene spent around 3,000 pounds, money that she had managed to save from her allowance, on a breast augmentation surgery. And this was a way for her to reassert some control over her own body and improve her self-esteem. But Fraser saw this as another way for Arlene to break free of his control, and he didn't react well to this. He saw this as a way for Arlene to make herself attractive to other men. So he shredded her clothes, and that way she couldn't go out with her friends. Then he hid her contact lenses and glasses. Once when she suggested they sleep in separate beds, he poured water on the spare bed, which forced her to sleep with him. His behavior towards her became increasingly erratic and unpredictable. In February 1998, he beat Arlene so brutally in her face and jaw that she couldn't eat. Her weight, which is already dangerously low from the Crohn's disease, fell even more, down to 98 pounds. Arlene became more withdrawn and more depressed. She told a girlfriend that not only did she not love her husband, she was also afraid of him. Yes, yeah, so he did agree to move out of the house for a month and live with his friend, Hector Dick, who owned a farm just outside of Elgin. Nat Fraser and Hector Dick had become friends while attending Elgin Academy, and they went out drinking together often. Fraser lived away from Arlene for less than one week, and the neighbors noticed that he was actually at the house more often during that week than he'd been when he was actually living there. <laughs> so he's working hard to get back. Yes. Of course, Arlene gave in to him, and she agreed that he could move back in with her and the children. But now the agreement was that if there was any more violence at all, there would be a divorce. They agreed that, though they would continue to live together, they would both be free to lead separate lives. Arlene would continue with her business studies with the intention of finding a job as soon as she was qualified. She would also continue to go out with her friends whenever she wanted. Now, not surprisingly, Fraser was not happy about this, but Arlene had made it known that these were the conditions. So he did agree to them and moved back in, but you can imagine it wasn't easy. He wasn't just going to go along with it. No, I mean, I think he was agreeing to it as a way to get back in her house and in her good graces, but he didn't have any intention of actually following up with it. No, he wanted things his way. Yeah. That's for sure. Now, for a while, things seemed to be calm at the Fraser house. But then in March of 1998, Fraser attempted to kill Arlene. She had gone out for the evening on a Sunday night with a group of three women friends. After the bar closed for the night, they all went back to her friend Michelle's house in New Elgin and continued their drinking. Arlene didn't arrive home until 5.30 in the morning, and Fraser was awake and waiting for her. Can when, you imagine? He must have been really enraged, and she must have been terrified. Yeah. Yeah. So when she did come in, Fraser confronted Arlene, and an argument escalated into violence. He beat Arlene, and he strangled her to the point she fell unconscious. Yeah, so that's terrifying. He nearly killed her. Yeah, he choked her to unconsciousness. It, yeah. It's not that much longer until he choked her into oblivion. Absolutely. Now, when she came to on the floor, Fraser told her that she had collapsed after having some kind of fit, like a seizure, and he denied that he had attacked her at all. And I guess she didn't remember exactly what had happened. But the next morning, Arlene realized that her eyes and her eyelids were very swollen and covered with tiny red dots. So after Fraser went to work that morning, she went to the doctor. And I'm going to let you explain this a little bit. Well, the doctor explained to her that the red dots in around her eyes and eyelids were petechiae. And these are broken capillary blood vessels, typically caused by strangulation. The doctor also told Arlene that he had only seen petechiae before on the dead bodies of strangulation victims. So how alarming would that be? Yeah. My God. I bet she realized then that uh, she was in serious trouble. I would hope, although it seems like she's had enough evidence over the years to know that. But I guess this is 
escalated to the point where it could have resulted in her death. Oh, absolutely, yes. It's so, really terrifying to think about. Yeah. And that's what the doctor told her. He said that she had been very close to death. The doctor also identified severe bruising on Arlene's shoulders, back, upper chest, and arms. The doctor told Arlene that she had to go to the police because her life was in danger from her husband. She was reluctant, but eventually she did agree to do that. So Arlene contacted the police and she explained to them what had happened. They arranged for her to be examined by another doctor. The petechiae in and around her eyes were so unusual that the police also had her examined by a pathologist, a medical practitioner who had experience in this kind of injury. In other words, experience with dead bodies. So the pathologist confirmed that Arlene had come very close to being killed by her husband. And as a result of these findings, Nat Fraser was arrested and charged with attempted murder. But this was difficult for Arlene. She was just horrified that the father of her children was going to go to jail. She just really wanted him to stay away from her. She even tried to cancel the charges against him, but it was too late for that. But Nat Frazier was released on bail and put under an injunction that he was not allowed to approach the house or Arlene. He went to stay with his business partner, Ian Taylor, in a village just about four miles outside of Elgin. Arlene went back to see her solicitor and this time she promised her that she would go through with a divorce. Plans were begun to file for the divorce on the grounds of Frazier's continuing violence towards her. They discussed what the financial settlement would be. So Arlene told her solicitor that Nat had offered her 30,000 pounds as a final settlement and warned that if she didn't accept this offer, he'd give her nothing at all, as if it was totally up to him. So the solicitor explained that it was usual in these cases to begin with a high claim and then allow this to be reduced during negotiation. So it was agreed that in view of Fraser's business interests and the property he owned, the initial claim would be for a settlement of 250,000 pounds. Yeah, I'm sure that's going to set well with Nat. Yeah, this seems to be something that really added to his rage and set him off. But what are you going to do? You can't just keep trying to please him. No matter what, he's an angry, violent person. He sure is. So from the moment he had been arrested, it was obvious that Fraser saw himself as the victim. Everything was Arlene's fault. In fact, in his mind, it was her fault that she'd stayed out late, and that made him angry enough to attack her. Of course. And of course, it was her fault that the police got involved. Well, sure. Who else are you going to blame? And once out on bail, he told Arlene that he would never forget what she had done to him. Of course, he didn't mention anything of what he had done to her. And when he learned that Arlene not only intended to divorce him, but that she was going to demand a larger settlement, he was positively enraged. Arlene told one of her friends, Marion, that Fraser had said to her, If you're not going to live with me, you will not be living with anyone. So that sounds like a death threat. So Frazier had other reasons for being nervous about the police or any kind of formal investigation into his business or his finances. Although the fruit and vegetable business did well, Frazier was also a partner in an illegal business with Hector Dick. So Frazier and Hector were involved in selling smuggled alcohol they bought from a gang. The level of duty charged on alcohol in the UK is high, and that's why there are such strict limits on how much alcohol and tobacco anyone is allowed to bring into the UK. So back in the early 90s, smugglers were bringing large amounts of alcohol purchased in Europe into the UK, hidden in trucks and cars. No one's sure how much bootlegged alcohol was brought into the UK, but it has been estimated that this was costing the UK government up to 100 million pounds a year in lost revenue. That's a significant amount. Certainly is. Alcohol smuggled into the UK in this way could be sold at prices way below those charged by legitimate sellers, while still providing some large profits for the smugglers. Many organized groups who'd previously been involved in smuggling drugs had switched to alcohol smuggling because the profits were almost as big, 
but the penalties were much less if they got caught. So by 1998, it was estimated that over 1 million smuggled pints of beer were being sold in the UK every single day. But the largest profits were earned in smuggling hard liquor, not beer or wine. Fraser and Hector are part of a distribution network capable of selling bootleg liquor to the public. So they weren't directly involved in the smuggling, but they were selling large quantities of liquor for the gang, and they did that by using the fruit and vegetable deliveries as a cover. That makes sense. Yeah. I, I could see that. It's almost perfect. And they're, they're out delivering to various stores and businesses. Yeah. And they just happen to have all the alcohol at the same time. Exactly. It's a good cover. It certainly is. And in 1998, the last thing that Fraser wanted was for the police to look into the details of his business or for Arlene's solicitor to demand a review of his finances. Arlene did know all about this bootlegging activity, and with a pending divorce, she was definitely a threat to his financial and his legal standing. The terms of his injunction meant that he had to leave Arlene his car for her use. He made several attempts to convince Arlene to let him have the car, but she refused. She stuck to her guns. But then on April 5th, two weeks after that attempted murder, Arlene heard strange noises out in front of her house. She looked out a window and saw that the car, which had been parked in the driveway, was on fire. So the fire department was called and the fire was put out, but the car was completely destroyed. So to me, that really tells me something. If he's willing to destroy the car rather than let her have it, yeah. it really just backs up his whole claim that if you're not going to live with me, you're not going to live with anyone. Like, if I can't have you, no one else can. The same type of thing. Exactly. But the insurance company initially decided that an electrical fault had caused the car fire. Then a more detailed investigation showed that it had actually been started on purpose. The arsonist wasn't identified, but it certainly made sense that Fraser had been behind it. He likely felt the same way about his car as he did about his wife, right? If he couldn't have it, no one would. Exactly. I know you said that she was aware of this uh, bootlegging operation. I think she could have used that to get more favorable settlement from him. Well, perhaps, but I think she was afraid of him and really didn't want to make him more angry. She That's really true. just wanted him to go away. Well, yeah, obviously. Yeah. So, yes, I think if he wasn't a violent person, she certainly could have held that over him. Oh, yeah. But I would imagine, as a smart woman, she didn't want to do more to just rile him up and make him more dangerous. Yeah, she didn't want to infuriate him any more than she already did. Exactly. So Arlene spent more time with her solicitor, Ms. Lennon, and discussed the terms of the divorce. They agreed to send their request for a financial settlement to Fraser's solicitor, and Arlene made an appointment to meet Ms. Lennon on the afternoon of Tuesday, April 28th. And at that appointment, they would discuss the final paperwork. Well, Tuesdays were the only weekdays when Arlene didn't have classes, so she used her Tuesdays to catch up with her friends. Arlene invited her friend Michelle to come to her house on the 28th for lunch and she really looked forward to talking with her friend while the children were off at school. Now remember when Fraser heard that Arlene was planning to ask for a settlement of 250,000 pounds, he was angry. He said that the most he could possibly come up with was 50,000. There were other financial issues which he hadn't shared with his wife. For one, he had told her and most other people that he had a mortgage on their home. But in truth, he owned it outright and there never was a mortgage. It was inevitable that Arlene's solicitor would find this out and more investigation into his money would be done and it would probably even increase the settlement amount above the 250,000 pounds. You know, Fraser knew that if he refused Arlene's financial demands, she could reveal details about his income from the bootlegging business to the police or to the Revenue and Customs Service. So Fraser was in a difficult position. Arlene had made it clear by this time that she wouldn't reconcile under any circumstances. But he believed that he couldn't afford a divorce either. So this is a quandary here, isn't it? Yes, and this must be why his mind turned to murder. Uh-huh. So we have established that Nat Fraser had a motive to make his wife disappear. Let's go to Tuesday, April 28th, which was this sunny spring day. And at around 8.15 that morning, Arlene was seen by a neighbor 
hanging up laundry in her yard. At about 8.50, she was seen by another neighbor at her front door, and this time she was waving goodbye to 10-year-old Jamie and 5-year-old Natalie as they left together on a short walk to the new Elgin Primary School. Jamie was especially excited that day because he had a field trip to an anti-litter event in Inverness. At 9.41 a.m., a phone call to the school from Arlene was answered by the school's receptionist. Arlene asked her what time Jamie would be getting back from Inverness, and the receptionist who took the call said she'd find out and call her right back. But that was the last time that anyone is known to have heard from Arlene. The receptionist tried calling her back just 10 minutes after that first call, and no one answered the home phone. It was 11 a.m. that morning when Arlene's friend Michelle showed up at Arlene's house for their planned lunch. There was no answer when she knocked on the door, so she tried the handle and it was unlocked. This struck Michelle as very odd. Arlene was very security conscious after her house had been burglarized back in the early 1990s, and since then Michelle had never known her friend to leave the door unlocked. So now quite concerned, Michelle entered the house and called out for Arlene, but the house was empty. So Michelle looked around and she noticed that the vacuum was sitting in the middle of Natalie's room, plugged in but turned off, it was as if Arlene had been interrupted while cleaning her daughter's room. But even more concerning, Michelle saw that the washing machine was still running. She knew that Arlene had a fear about washing machines causing fires, so she never left it running when she was out of the house for any amount of time. Michelle looked around some more and saw that Arlene's watch, contact lenses, glasses, and Crohn's disease medications were all sitting on the bedside table. There was an open makeup bag sitting on the bed and a bottle of foundation with the lid off sitting on the dressing table. The only thing that Michelle noticed was missing was Arlene's favorite faux leather brown coat. So Michelle had a very uneasy feeling and trying not to overreact, she left for home and then called Arlene's house several times over the next couple hours. But there was no answer. She returned to Arlene's house around 1 p.m., but there was still no sign of Arlene. Everything in the house was just as it had been earlier. So unsure of what to do, Michelle left a note asking Arlene to call her as soon as possible. So meanwhile, Nat Frazier had arrived at work at his usual time of 7.30 a.m. He left in the Frazier and Taylor delivery van to deliver fruits and vegetables throughout Elgin. But Frazier took a delivery boy with him on this particular morning, which was very unusual because in the recent years, he'd preferred to do the deliveries all by himself. Well, it's good to have a witness for your alibi, right? Yes, exactly. So a few minutes after 9 a.m., Fraser took a break from making his deliveries, and he made a call from a public phone box in the center of Elgin. He called up a young woman named Hazel Walker, who lived nearby and who was the niece of one of the other members of his band, the Minesweepers. Now, he hadn't spoken to her in months, if not years. He had arranged to call her the previous day, and he stayed on the phone chatting with her for about 40 minutes before resuming his delivery rounds. Then back at Arlene's house, it's just after 3 p.m., neighbors Irene Higgins and her husband Graham noticed that little Natalie was outside the house. Yeah, she's only five. Yeah, and she was all alone and seemed upset. Sure. So Irene spoke to Natalie, who explained that her mother wasn't there. Now, the Higgins, who had babysat Natalie before, took her to their house and waited with her for Arlene to return home. But instead, at 8 p.m., Michelle showed up and explained how worried she was about Arlene. Well, yeah, now she's missing for at least nine hours, as far right. as Michelle knows. Yep. And if you think about the phone call, it's even longer than that, when the receptionist tried to call her. So Michelle and Irene Higgins went into Arlene's house and looked around. There was still no sign of Arlene, and the house was just as it was before. The only thing new was that there was now a note on the hallway floor. This was from her son, Jamie Frazier, the 10-year-old, and it read, I was home at 7.30 p.m. You not in. Round at Mark's. Where are you? Unnoticed by the Higgins, Jamie had come home, saw that his mother wasn't there, and he'd left the note for her before going to his friend's house. When Michelle and Irene went back to the Higgins' house, they explained what they had found to Irene's husband, Graham Higgins. 
After discussing what they should do, Graham called the police. So that phone call would set off one of the largest missing persons cases ever investigated by the Grampian Police Force, which covered the northeast region of Scotland from the 1970s until 2013. And from the very beginning, the police treated Arlene's disappearance as something more sinister than a missing person case. The circumstances of her disappearance were very concerning. As a woman who was well known as a loving and caring mother, Arlene abandoning her two young children made no sense whatsoever. Her disappearance was even more alarming when considering that less than five weeks earlier, her estranged husband had been charged with her attempted murder. Oh my God, yes, that right? Would, that would certainly get you to notice. Oh yeah, I mean, that's just... There's just a straight fucking connection between the two. If someone tries to kill you and then you disappear, especially in a domestic violence situation with a divorce around the corner, it makes him look very bad. Why, yes. Definitely the primary suspect. So you would think. Absolutely. Now, there was another reason for the Grampian police to take a missing person case very seriously in the spring of 1998. Because back in the summer of 1997, Nine-year-old Scott Simpson had been reported missing by his parents in Aberdeen. Grampian police officers searched for the little boy, but found no trace of him. And then just five days later, Scott's body was found in an area that had supposedly already been searched by the police. Mm, so it looked really bad. So shoddy police work, at least in the eye of the public. Oh, absolutely, yes. Scott Simpson had been abducted and murdered by a pedophile. The murderer was eventually arrested, convicted, and sent to prison. But Grampian police came under intense scrutiny for their investigation. An independent report criticized the casual way the police had reacted to the initial report of the missing boy. Right, so that's part of the reason why they're going to react much more quickly and strongly sure. in this case. I mean, this is still burned into their memories. It's only a few months. Oh, absolutely, and... I don't care who you are or what you did, you're going to feel some guilt, some responsibility for not doing something more quickly, being more efficient. Oh, absolutely. So on April 24th, just four days before Arlene went missing, Dr. Ian Oliver, the chief constable of Grampian Police, resigned. And this was at least in part a, a result of criticism of the force's handling of the search for Scott. Yeah, so in the beginning, two officers came to Arlene's house to make sure that she wasn't anywhere on the property. They interviewed the neighbors, the Higgins, and Arlene's friend, Michelle. And when it was confirmed that Arlene really was missing, Detective Superintendent Jim Stephen was assigned to her case. Given the timing in relation to the Scott Simpson case, it really wasn't surprising that Detective Stephen made sure that no one could accuse him of being overly casual about Arlene's missing person case. From the moment that he was assigned to her case, he believed that he knew what had happened to her anyway. In a newspaper interview done later, he said, From early on, we all felt that this was not a missing person's inquiry. It was a murder. But because we couldn't find the body, there was no crime scene, all we had to go on was some circumstantial hints. And complicating the investigation was the fact that Nat Fraser's alibi for April 28th was just indisputable. Even this added to Stephen's suspicions. As far as he was concerned, truly innocent people rarely had such an ironclad alibi. So it was too perfect an alibi. Yes, it Stephen, seemed that way. Stephen believed that Fraser's actions that morning, including taking a delivery boy on his rounds when he usually went alone, and making that lengthy call at the same time that Arlene was thought to have gone missing, these were purposeful attempts to create an alibi for himself while a co-conspirator was abducting Arlene. Well, yeah, adding to that, when the detective learned that the public telephone box in Elgin, where Nat had made the call to Hazel Walker, was one of the few in town covered by CCTV cameras, and that there was a time-stepped video showing him making that call, he was even more sure that Fraser's behavior that morning was part of his overall plan to make it impossible that he could have been the one who abducted Arlene. So they think he purposely went somewhere where he would be caught on videotape with a timestamp. Yeah, he scouted things out. He had it all planned from what I can see. 
So the first police officers at Arlene's house returned several times that night to check that she hadn't returned. Then the next day, which was April 29th, they conducted a detailed search of the house. They found no evidence of any disturbance or foul play. They confirmed that Arlene's eyeglasses, contact lenses, and medication were still there. So was her passport, driving license, and keys. On Sunday, May 3rd, the police requested volunteers to help them search open areas in and around Elgin. Over 300 people volunteered. This included Arlene's father and stepmother. Nat Frazier did not participate. Then when officials began interviewing witnesses in Elgin, they found that most people believed that Arlene had simply gone away on holiday. There were widespread rumors that she'd been taking drugs, seeing other men, and drinking to excess. So the rumors made some people sympathetic to Fraser and resentful that the police were treating him like a suspect. At the same time, Stephen felt certain that it was Fraser himself who was the source of the rumors that damaged Arlene's character and reputation. Absolutely. I believe that he'd been planning it all along and setting it up to make her look unreliable and flighty so that when she did disappear, people would be more likely to think she just took off and left her family. But people who knew her well did not believe that for a second. No. But the problem is that there's enough people without good knowledge of the situation who would be swayed by that. Oh, sure. From the very beginning of the investigation, Fraser made it known that he was happy to help the police in any way that he could to find Arlene. Neighbor Graham Higgins had called him at Ian Taylor's house on the evening of the 28th to let him know that Arlene was missing. Then Fraser had discussed with Taylor whether he should check the hospitals in the area to see if Arlene had been there. But Taylor advised him that it would be better to just let the police handle the investigation. Still, Fraser made a point to learn the first names of all the senior officers involved in Arlene's case. He called the police station in Elgin often to ask if there had been any progress in the case. In early June, he talked to the press for the first time, making an appeal on TV, directly asking Arlene to return home to her children. So even there, he's suggesting that she left willingly, and he's asking her to come back. He was not pleading with whoever took her to please let her go, anything like that. Well, Fraser claimed that he believed that Arlene was still alive, but for some reason she had decided to leave. He even hinted that she might have disappeared in order to point suspicions at him while she was living happily with a new lover. That's clever. It is, but not true. He also told the police that there had been stashes of cash in their house that Arlene had taken. He kind of thought of everything there. Yeah, he's hitting all the buttons. But police knew what had happened, and they were convinced that Arlene was dead. They knew the history. Yeah. Now, in Scotland, the Presumption of Death Act of 1977 defines a mechanism of how a person may be declared legally dead even when the body isn't recovered. The Grampian police used guidance from this act to pursue a legal presumption that Arlene Fraser was dead. This was necessary if they were to seek out a murder conviction. Well, yeah, you got to have a declaration of death. Yes, that's essential. Officers took over 2,500 statements from witnesses. Yeah, they contacted banks, financial institutions, and government agencies. If Arlene Frazier tried to open a bank account, claim any benefits, apply for a new driver's license or passport, or try to get a prescription for glasses or contact lenses, the Grampian police would be notified immediately. But they never heard a thing. Nothing. So there was no evidence that she was alive. But at the same time, there was no evidence that she had been murdered either. And the case was in danger of going cold until in December of 1998, the police finally got some information. And this came from an unexpected source. Yeah, a witness came forward to police and told them that while out drinking in a pub in Elgin, he had overheard a conversation which seemed to be about Arlene's disappearance. He had heard a man saying that he had sold a car to a friend of Nat Frazier just before Arlene's disappearance, but that he had been paid not to talk about this. The police identified the person overheard in the pub as 36-year-old Kevin Ritchie, an Elgin man who worked as a mechanic in a local garage. When questioned, Ritchie admitted that he had delivered a beige, 1984 Ford Fiesta 
to Hector Dick at Wester Hillside Farm, just outside of Elgin, on April 27th, the day before Arlene disappeared. He also told the police that Nat Frazier had been there when he delivered the car and that Hector Dick had paid him 400 pounds in cash and an extra 50 pounds in exchange for him agreeing to keep quiet. When the police interviewed Hector Dick, he denied ever buying a car from Kevin Ritchie. Then a short time later, police talked to 26-year-old Richard Murray, who is the manager of a scrapyard around 10 miles from Elgin. He told the police that in May of 1998, three men had brought a partially crushed beige Ford Fiesta to the scrapyard. The car had been crushed and recycled. So if, if there's any evidence to be gleaned from that car... It's gone. So police questioned Hector Dick on many occasions in 1999 about the Ford Fiesta and its disposal, but he continued to deny knowing anything. Yeah, the police were able to persuade Kevin Ritchie to talk to Hector Dick about the car while wearing a wire in a place where the meeting could be video recorded. At the meeting, Hector was recorded talking about the Ford Fiesta and agreeing that he had bought it from Ritchie. Hector also gave Richie advice on what to do if he was ever questioned by the police. He told him to tell the police that he couldn't remember and just walk away. So this was advice that Hector would follow himself over the next 15 years or more. In October of 1999, both Hector and Fraser were charged with perverting the course of justice with the Ford Fiesta. Both denied the charges and both appeared in court. The charge against Fraser was later dropped. Hector's defense team filed an appeal, claiming that he was unlikely to receive an unbiased hearing in Elgin, and they requested that the trial be relocated. The trial was deferred as police continued their investigation. Yannette Frazier did end up in court for the attempted murder charge, stemming from that attack on Arlene back in March of 1998. On March 1st, 2000, he appeared in the High Court in Edinburgh to receive his sentence. The original attempted murder charge was reduced to assault to the danger of life. Arlene's family, who all believed that Fraser was involved in her disappearance, were disappointed by this lesser charge. Nat Fraser pled guilty, and he was sentenced to 18 months in prison for what the judge called a nasty, wholly unprovoked, and dangerous assault. He was released from prison in December of 2000, so he wasn't in there very long. Doesn't seem to be. No. Now, Hector Dick was in court in February of 2001 on the charge of perverting the course of justice because of his lies about the Ford Fiesta. He pled not guilty. For the first four days of the trial, he denied knowing anything at all about the Fiesta. Then, on the fifth day of the trial, he changed his plea to guilty after it had been ruled that video footage of him discussing the car with Kevin Ritchie would be admissible as evidence. So Hector claimed that his previous denials to police were due to the car being used as part of the alcohol smuggling operation that he and Nat Fraser had been running, and not because he had been involved in Arlene's disappearance. Hector was sentenced to one year in prison. Well, the police team investigating Arlene's disappearance continued to believe that the missing car had been used to abduct Arlene, but this was never proven. During his time in prison, Hector was subjected to further questioning by the police about Arlene's disappearance. He attempted to commit suicide by hanging himself, but the attempt was unsuccessful. He later explained that he had been on a downward spiral at the time. In April of 2001, Nat Fraser was found guilty of fraudulently claiming 18,000 pounds of legal aid money during his assault trial. It was found that he had money which he'd hidden from the authorities in order to qualify for legal aid. So this guy just seems to have a really criminal, greedy way of doing things. He just can't stay away from it. I know. So just four months after being released from prison for that assault charge, he was sentenced to another 12 months for that. Now during his incarceration on the assault charge, there had been a significant finding in the investigation. Fraser was visited in prison by Glenn Lucas, a man who ran his own fruit and vegetable business. Lucas had been a childhood friend of Fraser, and he had helped him set up his fruit and vegetable partnership with Ian Taylor. Lucas was known to the police because he had made multiple complaints about the police's handling of the Arlene Fraser investigation, claiming that his friend was being treated unfairly. 
Police were interested in everyone who visited Fraser in prison, so they viewed all surveillance tapes of his visits. There were several visits by Glenn Lucas, and during one of them in July of 2000, police noticed that the two had a volatile discussion. Unfortunately, the tapes had no audio. To help them figure out what had been said, the police contacted Jessica Reese, one of the UK's leading forensic lip readers. Ms. Reese had been deaf from birth, and she became a professional forensic lip reader in 1995. So first of all, didn't they know ahead of time that this video recording would have no audio? I don't understand how they just seemed to figure that out after. Well, I guess the only answer would be they assumed it would be audio <laughs> and video. I guess. And then when they got it, they said, whoops, no audio. Well, that's kind of a big deal. And well, it does end up being a big deal in the case as it well. It sure does. Now, forensic lip reading, which I personally had never even heard of. I didn't know it existed. No, me either. But it's very difficult when it involves lip reading from CCTV or videotapes, as you can imagine. It's not the same as someone standing in front of you talking to you. Image quality can be very poor, and the speaker's often not even facing the camera. But Rees had a reputation for being able to produce results even in the most difficult of cases. She had worked in hundreds of cases. She had testified in cases that resulted in the conviction of members of the IRA and the Russian Mafia. The Grampian police asked her to view and provide a transcript for the conversation between Glenn Lucas and Nat Fraser. So she agreed. In cases where a forensic lip reader is asked to provide an interpretation, which may be used in court, the police are not supposed to give any clues or context about why they want the conversation interpreted. But when the Grampian police sent the tapes to Miss Rees, they included a case summary. The summary was clearly marked and sealed, and Miss Rees said that she had placed it in a locked filing cabinet before she did her interpretation. But that's questionable to me, and also, you have to wonder, didn't she already know about the case? There was so much publicity about it. I'm sure she knew something about it. So if she knew it was about the murder of his wife, that kind of puts a whole new spin on it. Now, within a few weeks, Ms. Reese sent her findings to the police, and they were shocking. Part of her transcript of what Nat Fraser had said included, her arms are off and I pulled her teeth out. They can't find her. It's impossible, isn't it? Later on in the conversation, she reported that he said, I'll get away with it. It's all right. There's no evidence. It's all down the plug hole. So the police don't know shite. So fuck the lot of them. Okay. So she also noted that more than once during the conversation, Nat Fraser mentioned that he was concerned that someone called Hecky, presumably Hector Dick, because he did go by that nickname Hecky, might crack under pressure and tell the police something that he shouldn't. So, if this is believable, it is pretty groundbreaking. But there's just so many questions about it, which we'll talk more about later. But the detectives working Arlene's case were really thrilled. At last, they had evidence directly linking Fraser to his wife's murder. The circumstances of the conversation strongly suggested that both Glenn Lucas and Hector Dick had been involved. If they could be confident about Miss Ree's interpretation, they really had a good foundation for moving forward with charges against all three of these men. Rees did assure them that her transcript was completely reliable. She explained that she had to be very confident in order to include any words in her transcript, and that only happened after a very extensive process, which involved looking at sections of videotape up to 50 or 60 times. In October of 2001, Fraser was released from prison after serving over six months for the legal aid fraud. He was repeatedly questioned by the police about Arlene. By now, he was clearly their main suspect. Oh, yeah. But unknown to him, the police also had another significant piece of circumstantial evidence. On April 29th, the day after Arlene disappeared, police had done a detailed search of the house and taken video showing all the rooms. After the disappearance, Arlene's stepmother had stopped by to check on the house. She had already been there several times when she went back on the afternoon of May 7, 1998. 
eight days after Arlene had gone missing. When she went to clean the bathroom, she was surprised to see three rings hanging on a wooden dowel beneath the soap dish. These were Arlene's engagement, wedding, and eternity rings. The stepmother was absolutely certain that they hadn't been there when she had come to the house the other times. Well, right. So the police reviewed the video they'd made inside of the house on April 29th, and it showed the bathroom with no rings on that wooden dowel at that time. Sometime between April 29th and May 7th, someone had returned those rings to the house and left them where Arlene normally kept them when she wasn't wearing them. Now, interestingly, the injunction that kept Nat Fraser from visiting the house had been lifted on May 7th. The only people that had access to the house during the injunction were the stepmom and the police. But Fraser did have access on May 7th. If the stepmom and the police hadn't put the rings there, that left only Fraser, And that meant that Arlene had been wearing her rings when she was abducted and murdered, and that Fraser had returned them to the house as soon as he could. Now why would he do that? It was suggested that he was just so greedy that he wanted to be able to recover them and get money for them. Mm, sure. Now, finally, on April 26, 2002, arrests of Nat Frazier, Hector Dick, and Glenn Lucas were announced. They were charged with murder, conspiracy to murder, and attempting to defeat the ends of justice. Nat Frazier was the only one of the three with an obvious motive. Hector Dick's involvement was mainly because of the lies he had told about the Ford Fiesta. The charge against Glenn Lucas was made on the basis of the transcript of his discussion with Fraser in prison, the one that had been translated by the lip reader. The police didn't know what his role in the abduction and murder had been, but they knew that he had been in Elgin a few days before Arlene disappeared. So they really felt confident that he was involved in some way. So the trial began on January 7, 2003. Fraser was so sure that he would be acquitted that he had gone to the tabloids and offered to sell them his story for 80,000 pounds once the trial was completed. He told them that his story was one of an innocent man who was being unfairly accused by the police. The first four days of the trial consisted of the prosecutor laying out what they believed had happened to Arlene. Then on the fourth day, the jury was shown the video proving that Arlene's rings were not in the bathroom on the day after she disappeared. And that was followed by testimony from Arlene's stepmother about how they had reappeared on May 7th. Yes, yeah, so the court adjourned that weekend, and then on Monday, the prosecution said that they would not be moving forward with any of the charges against Hector Dick or Glenn Lucas. Both were released. They now planned to call Hector Dick as a witness against Nat Fraser. So made a deal. Made a deal, right. So Hector Dick had this deal that was made over the weekend. In addition to the charges against him in Arlene's case, he also was being investigated for unpaid taxes from the smuggling liquor business. So he was facing a bill of over 250,000 pounds. He would only be able to pay that amount if he sold his farm, which he didn't want to do. So Hector Dick agreed that he would give testimony against Nat Fraser in exchange for dropping the murder charge and all of those tax charges. The decision to drop the charges against Glenn Lucas seemed to be based on a lack of evidence. Other than the transcripts made by that lip reader, Jessica Rees, they really had no evidence against Lucas. But it's a little bit problematic that Hector Dick is testifying after being offered such a great deal. <laughs> no kidding. Yeah, I mean, it's really quite a deal that makes it hard to believe anything he says. Uh, in his testimony, Dick gave a very different story than he had in April of 1998. While on the stand, he didn't look at Nat Frazier at all. Hector was asked about his role in getting the beige Ford Fiesta. He had claimed at his 2001 trial for perverting a course of justice that the car had been purchased for use in a liquor smuggling operation. But now he told the court that the car had been purchased at the request of Nat Fraser and left in the yard of his farm with the keys in it on the evening of April 27th. At some point that night, the car was removed. Hector said, but he didn't see who took it. Yeah, according to Hector, the car reappeared on Sunday, May 3rd. But at that point, it had a pile of children's clothing and a woman's brown coat inside of it. Now, remember, that's one thing that Arlene's friend Michelle noticed was missing from the house was her favorite brown coat. Right. 
Hector said that he had burned the car before crushing it with the digger on his tractor. Then he had loaded it onto a trailer and taken it to the scrapyard. This version was in part confirmed by Richard Murray, the manager of Spay Bay Salvage. Murray testified that Hector Dick was one of the three men who had brought the Fiesta to his yard to be crushed in early May of 1998. Then Hector spoke about his friendship with Nat Fraser. He claimed that in the time period between Fraser moving out of his house after he had attacked Arlene and before her disappearance, Fraser had said several things to him that concerned Hector. Fraser had told him that more than 10,000 people went missing every year and were never found. He had also told Hector that only two people in Scotland had ever been convicted of murder when a body couldn't be found. He said that he had read that forensic scientists needed at least three inches of bone in order to make a positive identification on a missing person. He also said Hector claimed that he knew people who did things like that. And Hector also told the court that Fraser was very jealous of his wife and worried that she might be seeing other men. He had told him that he couldn't bear the thought of his children living with another man. Fraser was also afraid that Arlene could get a divorce settlement that would financially ruin him. Well, when he was asked about how he felt when he heard that Arlene had disappeared, Hector said that he had been alarmed. The defense pointed out that most of what Hector had previously told police was untrue. So Hector was described as a habitual serial liar. And Hector admitted that he had lied. But he now claimed that it was because of his loyalty to Frazier at the time. Frazier testified in his defense in late January, and he told the court that he loved Arlene, but he did admit that their marriage was quite stormy at times. For legal reasons, the jury members weren't told about his previous conviction for that March 1998 assault on Arlene, which was basically attempted murder. He denied murdering Arlene or being involved in any way in her abduction or her murder. I just have a tough time, and I know you can't explain it, but why was that information not allowed to be given at trial? Yeah, I'm not sure. I know sometimes they can't bring up, you know, previous crimes. Right, but this was close to the time when she disappeared. Right, and same victim. Same victim, and it was attempted murder. I know. That seems quite likely to be useful. Yeah, it seems important. Yeah. Yeah, it does. I'm not sure either. Of course, Scottish law is different. I did do some reading on Scottish law, but as not being a lawyer or a solicitor, I don't really understand exactly what mechanism was in place for that. But it was found by the judge that that could not be included. Yeah. And I think you're right. That was an important thing. Yeah. Yeah. Now, that extensive police presumption of death investigation made it clear that Arlene Frazier was, in fact, dead. And no one other than Nat Frazier had any known reason to kill her. The testimony of Hector Dick strongly suggested that Frazier had arranged for the murder of his wife, but then his previous lies under oath really hurt his credibility. The only hard physical evidence really was Arlene's rings, and that's not that strong. And these rings would become the most important piece of evidence against him. Yeah, the jury returned with a guilty verdict. Nat Frazier blinked rapidly, slumped over in his seat, stared at the floor. At sentencing, the judge called Frazier evil and told him that someone would have to explain to his two children that he was now convicted of killing their mother. Frazier was sentenced to life imprisonment with a recommendation that he serve a minimum of 25 years. As the sentence was read out in court, Fraser crumpled over and had to be helped out of the courtroom. Well, it really does seem that he was confident he was leaving. Uh-huh. And I can kind of see it because the evidence was not really strong, hard evidence. But on the other hand, there was a lot of circumstantial evidence that was very convincing as well. Yeah, well, I think he's guilty. Well, I think he's guilty too. I just don't know if it's beyond a reasonable doubt. But you know, one thing I did learn about Scottish law is they don't need it to be unanimous. So there could be a juror or two who doesn't agree, and they could still be convicted. Huh, okay. So that's interesting. Now, of course, Arlene's family members were relieved with the verdict. Most people believe that this was the end of the story. After Fraser's conviction, the police also explained to the media 
that the information provided by lip reader Jessica Rees had helped to convince them of Fraser's guilt. The transcript of the conversation between Nat Fraser and Glenn Lucas had not been introduced at the trial. They also vowed to continue to try and find Arlene's body. On April 21, 2003, the family finally was able to have a memorial service for Arlene. They pretty much had to accept that her body would never be found. Certainly, Nat Fraser was never going to tell where it was. No. A series of articles about Arlene Fraser's case ran in the Daily Record newspaper. These were based on exclusive information provided by Hector Dick to the newspaper. It was revealed that on the weekend of the 11th and 12th of January, Hector hadn't been just negotiating with the prosecution to have the charges against him dropped. Oh no, he had also been negotiating a very lucrative deal with the Daily Record to give them exclusive details about the case. He had even received a payment of 20,000 pounds for his stories. In the articles, Hector Dick made new statements about the case which differed significantly from the evidence he had testified to in court. Yeah, this guy's just a problem. To me, he's not believable at all. Well, not if he changes stories at the drop of a hat. Well, and he's getting paid for his story, and he got a great deal from the prosecutor. Yeah. Now, along with other things, Hector claimed that Fraser had hired a professional killer from down south who had gone to the house on April 28th and strangled Arlene. Fraser had then gone to the house, removed her body, cleaned up the scene, and burned Arlene's body in a charcoal pit in the woods. Many people were offended to think that someone who was an admitted accessory to murder could be allowed to sell this story to a newspaper. Arlene's family complained to the Press Complaints Commission about the articles, but their complaints were dismissed. So Hector Dick was able to go on providing exclusive interviews to the Daily Record and making money from them. Yeah, well, and the newspaper is probably making money too. Yeah, it just doesn't seem right though, does it? No. In December of 2003, Glenn Lucas persuaded the News of the World newspaper to pay for and witness him taking a lie detector test to refute the allegations against him and this test was administered by one of the UK's leading polygraph operators. So the operator reported that Lucas was telling the truth. Then in April of 2005, a book about the case, titled Murdered or Missing, was published. This book was written by professional crime writer Reg McKay, who had previously published several books about sensational Scottish crime cases. But the co-author was Glenn Lucas. This book claimed to be a true account of the case, but many people have described it as an attempt by Lucas to exonerate himself. It did this by spelling out two equally implausible and contradictory scenarios. The book suggested that Arlene Fraser wasn't really dead at all. Instead, she'd walked out on her life and her children in order to start a new life somewhere else. The basis for this seemed to be that there had been some alleged sightings of Arlene after she disappeared but none of these sightings had panned out. Also, developing a new identity, which is what Arlene would have had to do if she was still alive, because remember, they checked all the avenues of financial institutions, driver's license, anything she would have done under her real name. Yeah, they had plenty of stuff covering her real name. Right. So if she was to disappear, she would have needed time, money, and access to criminals with very specialized skills in helping her disappear. Now, Arlene had none of these, and the book didn't explain how she could have pulled this off at all. And sadly, the book also suggested that Arlene was not the respectable housewife and loving mother that most people believed she had been. A witness was found who claimed to have seen Arlene at drug parties, and it was said that she drank to excess. Again, many of her friends who knew her were outraged and angry at these horrible suggestions that were so far from the truth you couldn't even begin to compare. She was a devoted mother who spent her evenings with the children, except for the occasional Saturday night when she went out with her friends. They also pointed out that her Crohn's disease meant that she was never able to have more than a couple of drinks, and she could not have been taking drugs. So what do you think of that from a medical point of view? Well, the drink part, sure. 
Yeah. I don't know that Crohn's disease meant you couldn't take drugs. That's not going to necessarily worsen your disease. Yeah. I don't know if there'd be contraindications between illicit drugs and the medications she was on, but certainly alcohol would be very irritating, wouldn't it? It can be, but yeah. still, you could certainly drink a couple drinks. Depending on the person. Yeah. Well, one thing that the book didn't spend any time considering at all was that Nat Fraser had been directly involved in Arlene's disappearance. It claimed that the police had decided from the very beginning that Fraser had murdered his wife. The book stated that key witnesses were bullied by police to ensure that they gave testimony that supported Fraser's guilt. It was noted that some witnesses had changed their evidence in ways that tended to support the police version of events. Now, one example given was Richard Murray, the manager of Spay Bay Salvage, who was first interviewed in October of 1998 about the men who brought the beige Ford Fiesta to the yard. He had described the man he had spoken to as being in his early 20s. Then, after Fraser was charged with Arlene's murder, Murray's testimony changed, and he positively identified Hector Dick. Now, this is according to the book. I haven't been able to verify this. But, of course, Nat Fraser appealed his conviction. In March 2006, an investigation was announced into the police handling of the Arlene Fraser investigation. An outside review was done into the way the investigation had been carried out, and in particular to examine the question of Arlene's rings. So there was evidence that two police officers had seen the rings and that information had been withheld from the defense. So that's really something. That's a lot of something. That's a big one, yeah. So that May, Fraser was let out on bail pending the result of his appeal. Two Grampian police officers claimed to have seen the rings on April 28th, so both were questioned, and both claimed that they had been subjected to pressure to change their stories when the importance of the rings became known. During an interview, one officer said that she believed her police career was over if she spoke about the rings. She also claimed that she had been told to say nothing about what she had seen. The investigation into Grampian police continued through 2006, but in September, Glenn Lucas died of a heart attack. And within days, Hector Dick provided the Daily Record newspaper with another exclusive. This time, he attacked Lucas. Well, yeah, it's easy once he's dead. Yeah, you know, that's, <laughs> that's just, just so evident. That's really shitty. Hector Dick told the newspaper that Lucas had known more about Arlene's disappearance than he ever admitted. He also said that Glenn Lucas had come to his farm in 2005 and had threatened his life if he said anything that might hurt Nat Fraser. So this is just kind of a mess. The Glenn Lucas and the Hector Dick stuff. And the rings. So even though I do believe that Nat Fraser killed Arlene Fraser, it's really not a great case. No, I think you can let the case fall on what you got. Meaning there's, what? There's no need to hide the rings and then put them back out there. Right, which we don't know if they did, but having these police officers testify to that is fairly convincing to me because uh -huh. you really can't believe what Hector Dick says. Not at all. He's totally out for himself. But then Nat Fraser's appeal was pretty simple. The police evidence about the rings had been a central part of the prosecution case in that original trial, and it was now becoming clear that this evidence was seriously flawed. The prosecution's argument was also pretty simple. Despite the fact that at the previous trial the rings had been described as the cornerstone of the prosecution's case, there still had been plenty of other evidence to convict him without that evidence of the rings. So the appeal went back and forth for over two weeks before all the evidence had been heard. The judge then ordered that Nat Fraser should be put back in prison while awaiting the outcome of the appeal, even though it could take several months. And he was pretty surprised and unhappy with that turn of events. Yeah. He didn't expect to be going back to jail. I guess not. So it took six more months after the 10th anniversary of Arlene's disappearance, and then the verdict was announced. The appeal was denied and the verdict was upheld. Nat Fraser was to stay in prison and serve out the rest of his sentence. In November 2009, Fraser claimed at the Court of Criminal Appeal in Edinburgh that he did not get a fair trial at his appeal, but this was denied. 
Then in early 2010, he and his defense team announced that they would appeal his case at the Supreme Court in London. So the hearing in London began on March 21, 2010. Just four days later, the result was announced. Nat Fraser's appeal was upheld and his conviction for the murder of his wife was quashed. Now he was a free man again. Well, well, well. Yeah, so one of the Supreme Court appeal judges gave a written account of the reasoning behind this decision. And it's short, so I'm just going to read it. The fact is that the Crown chose to present the case at the trial in a way that it would not have chosen to do it if it had been aware at the time of the trial that there was evidence that the rings were in the house within hours of Arlene's disappearance. It was information that ought to have been given to the defense, and the failure to do this was a breach of the appellant's right to a fair trial. So that's understandable. Yeah. Now many in the public were confused about the prospect of a second murder trial for Nat Fraser. What about double jeopardy? So this legal precept states that a person should not be tried twice for the same crime. It's a great movie, too. Tommy a, Lee Jones and uh, what's her name? Ashley Judd. I enjoy that movie. I've that seen it many times. Movie. Yeah, it's a fun movie. Anyway. But there's a caveat. The concept of double jeopardy is based on the idea that a person cannot be tried again for the same crime once they had been to court and received a valid conviction or acquittal. The fact that the Supreme Court had quashed Nat Fraser's guilty verdict meant that he hadn't received a valid conviction. So by that way of thinking, he could be tried again, and prosecutors were determined to retry him. Oh yeah, they were just strongly convinced that he was responsible for Arlene being murdered, and they weren't going to let up on it at all. Nope, they were going to get him. Yeah, but for the next two years, he was free on bail. By this time, there was really a widespread belief that he had been behind Arlene's murder. And then there were some significant developments in the case. One big concern was Jessica Reese, the lip reader who had provided police with that damning transcript that seemed to show Frazier discussing the disposal of Arlene's body with Glenn Lucas while in prison. After that first murder trial, the police had released this information to the press, even pointing out that it was this transcript that had finally convinced them to charge Frazier with Arlene's murder. After the transcripts were released in which Frazier appeared to be discussing cutting off his wife's arms and pulling out her teeth, he was a hated man. It seemed that no one believed Frazier's innocence anymore. Frazier's business partner, Ian Taylor, reacted as most others did, too. Before the trial, he'd been very supportive of Frazier. After the verdict and the release of those transcripts, he issued a statement saying that he had been misled and that he wanted nothing more to do with Frazier. He even changed the name of the fruit and vegetable business from Taylor and Frazier to Spayfruit, and he later sued Frazier for 20,000 pounds for an unpaid tax bill. In 2005, the Crown Prosecution Service in England had issued a notice that it would not be using Jessica Rees as an expert witness in any current or future cases. The notice read, As a precaution, the Crown Prosecution Service is contacting defendants or their representatives in those cases where Jessica Rees gave evidence for the prosecution and which resulted in a conviction. They will be provided with a disclosure package to enable them to advise their clients. So that was really big news. Part of the problem was that in 2005, Rees had been giving testimony as an expert witness at a case in Snaresburg Crown Court in London. A diligent defense barrister, Edward Henry, pointed out that she did not actually have a degree from Oxford as she had claimed. So this was enough for the CPS to decide not to use her again as an expert witness. But there was worse information to come. By the time that Fraser was waiting for his second trial to begin, some of the work that she had done as an expert witness had been reviewed, and the findings were very concerning. Professor Summerfield of the Medical Research Council Institute of Hearing Research in Nottingham 
was asked to test Jessica Rhee's lip reading skills. In a test involving 820 words, Summerfield noted that she got 55% correct. That's not great. That's probably not very good. Yeah. No. He also reported that she identified 224 words that were not even spoken, not in the conversation at all. So other experienced forensic lip readers were asked to review a videotape from which she had produced a 2100-word transcript back in 1999, and they agreed with only 234 of the words she provided. So what percent is that? Yeah, that's a 10. 10 percent. That's pretty bad. Experts reviewed her findings in other cases then and said that some of the videotapes from which she had worked were just too poor quality to allow any lip reading to be done at all by anyone. But Rees had provided detailed transcripts based on those tapes. The tapes of Fraser's conversation in prison were shown to a well-respected and experienced forensic lip reader, and he admitted that he was unable to agree with any of the key words provided by Rees. So it was clear that there were some serious doubts about her transcripts of Nat Fraser's conversation with Glenn Lucas. These concerns about the reliability of Rhee's work got far less media coverage than the initial reporting of her transcripts had. And remember that initial reporting had really caused people to believe in his guilt and hate him. Most people had been left believing that Fraser must be guilty because he had been recorded talking about disposing of his wife's body. So this was a real problem. Well, yeah. This is all after the verdict came in. At the first trial. At the first trial. Right. It was yeah. not presented as evidence at trial. No, it wasn't. So it was mainly just that it had been released in the media. Right. And that any jury they would get would already feel like he was guilty. That was the main complaint. So his second trial began on April 23, 2012. The judge opened proceedings by warning the jury that they must put out of their minds anything they thought they knew about the case and concentrate only on the testimony given at this trial. The defense team claimed that Fraser had an alibi, which meant that he could not have murdered Arlene, and they now named Hector Dick as Arlene's killer. So according to the defense, the case was blighted by hindsight and assumption, and the prosecution's evidence was completely unreliable. But Fraser was again found guilty, and this time he was sentenced to 17 years in prison. The judge told the court that Fraser had instigated the murder of his wife in cold blood and that it had been carried out with ruthless efficiency. In September of 2013, Fraser appealed the verdict of the second trial on the basis that a comment by a witness was prejudicial because she had mentioned his previous conviction for assault on Arlene. The appeal was refused. Fraser continues to claim that he is innocent and he has attempted to appeal the verdict of the second trial. He will be eligible for parole in 2029, at which time he'll be 69 years old. Well, Arlene's family continued to believe that Fraser is guilty of arranging her disappearance and murder, and some of them are also convinced that Hector Dick was the actual killer. Arlene's daughter Natalie married and has her own children now. Hector Dick continued to work at his farm, Ian Taylor continued to operate his fruit and vegetable business in Elgin and eventually passed on the business to his younger family members. After reviewing all of the case files I could find and reading the book Death in a Cold Town by Steve McGregor, I believe that Nat Fraser probably had Arlene murdered and that Hector Dick was somehow involved. Fraser had been very violent toward Arlene just weeks before, almost killing her that time. Also, no one else had any credible motive for wanting Arlene dead. So as far as motive goes, at least, Fraser was the only person, the only reasonable suspect. The idea that Arlene may not actually be dead but had run away from her children does not seem at all credible, and her family and friends say that is virtually impossible, because of course they'd love for her to be alive, but they just know it isn't true still, I'd have to say that the evidence against Fraser was pretty weak. At his first trial, there was the issue with Arlene's rings, and there's now no doubt that they must have been removed from the house before the police video was made for some unknown reason, and they must have been replaced later by someone in the police department. So to me, that casts a real shadow on the conviction. 
when the significance of the absence and return of those rings later became a core part of the prosecution's case. There were members of the police force who knew this was inaccurate, but who chose not to speak up so that Fraser would be convicted. There had been persistent claims that the rings were in the desk of a senior police officer while they were missing from the Fraser house, though this is hearsay and not proven. And also, to be fair, you have to say that the police were focused in on Nat Fraser from the very beginning and may have had some tunnel vision in conducting their investigation. Yeah, so there were some major issues with the second trial because after the first trial, its verdict and all that information were widely reported in Scotland. And there was also that reporting based on the transcript prepared by Rees, which did seem to prove that Fraser had been recorded discussing dismembering his wife's body. But now we know that was not reliable. The fact that the transcript and Rees' professional reputation were seriously questioned never got the same amount of media coverage as her initial conclusions. So when Fraser did return to his trial in 2012, none of the jurors could have been unaware of his first conviction or the reporting surrounding that. So it may not have been possible for him to get a fair second trial. And then, of course, there's the shaky testimony of Hector Dick, who lied and changed his story several times. No direct evidence against Fraser was presented at his second trial. All of the evidence presented in court was circumstantial, and a lot of that was based on conjecture and assumptions. Although there's nothing wrong with a circumstantial case, it's done all the time. Despite all this, I'll just say that I believe both guilty verdicts were correct and that Fraser is guilty of arranging Arlene's murder. But there were a lot of problems with these trials, and yes. the investigation for that matter. There certainly were. Yeah, but it seems like we did get some justice for Arlene, although that Hector Dick is certainly a shady character. Yeah, uh, like we've said a lot of times, just because he's a rotten person doesn't mean he's a murderer. No. But going to the media and getting paid for his story, changing his story, I feel pretty confident that he was the hands-on killer of Arlene. Could have been, sure. Yeah, could have been. We know it wasn't the husband. Nope. He's got the airtight alibi. He does. And that whole car thing with Hector Dick, it's very suspicious. Yeah. TCB's music was produced by Mike McClellan. You can find out more about his work at his website, podcastps.com. If you have comments, a case suggestion, or even a beer recommendation, please send us an email to truecrimebrewery at tiegrabber.com. Or even better, leave us a voicemail. I will put a direct link in our show notes for you to click on and record your voicemail for a future show. Well, thanks, Dickie. So our listeners may be asking themselves, how can I support True Crime Brewery and get myself some bonus episodes and then get all of my episodes without ads? Well, we've figured this all out for you. We have our True Crime Brewery premium option where you get your own personal URL to add to your podcast app and you can subscribe to our show completely free of commercials. Plus, you get at least one special members-only episode each and every month and we'll send you a gift, some swag, and a handwritten thank you note. Members also have the option of listening to the ad-free episodes on our website. If you think you'd enjoy these benefits and you'd like to help support the show, please go to our website, tiegrabber.com, and take a look at our subscribing options. You also have the option of subscribing through Patreon, and you can do that by going to patreon.com slash tiegrabber. Whether you support us by listening, sharing your feedback, leaving a five-star review on Apple Podcasts, or subscribing as a premium member, we appreciate all of you, and we thank all of you. It's time for listener feedback. So let's listen to a case suggestion by Tammy. Hi, Jill and Dick. This is Tammy from Texas. I love you guys. I love your podcast. I just listened to the most recent one, which was the Stanton Jewelry Store Slangs. It was great. At the end, a woman named Renee 
mentioned that um, after the last podcast, someone had suggested the Sherry Papini kidnapping, which uh, that was me. I did that. And it made her think of the Denise Huskins and Aaron Quinn kidnapping that they had thought was a hoax. And then it made me think of yet another one that's different from those two, but it was a kidnapping. Uh, Denise Amber Lee out of Northport, Florida. And the interesting thing about hers was that she was on the phone with 911 because she managed to get her kidnapper's phone. And the authorities were so close to finding her and there were miscommunications um, another woman had actually seen the car when Denise Amberly was still in there alive and she was suspicious and she had called in but they didn't make the connection it was very interesting and so just the mention of the kidnapping ones made me think of that one and I don't think you guys have done that one yet uh, if you have, I can't find it. Uh, but if you haven't, I would sure love to hear you do it. I love you guys. Continue doing what you do. Thank you. Thanks so much, Tammy. We really appreciate you sharing feedback and doing it more than once. Super cool. So that does sound like a pretty horrific case and a fascinating story. It is. Just to maybe clarify a couple points from Tammy. The cell phone of the assailant that the victim managed to get a hold of was a uh, prepaid cell phone. And so you couldn't locate the place of the call. Oh, so it was like a burner phone? Like a burner phone, right. And then there's the story of a, a witness who was at a traffic light or something and could hear screaming coming from the car next to her. Really? And she thought that it actually it was a parent, somebody kidnapping a child. So she called 911. Somehow things got mishandled and they, they didn't find the victim until she'd been killed. Wow, that's really sad, huh? Just to think you're that close to maybe being able to save her, it's heartbreaking. It is. It really is. But that'd be something I think would be interesting to look into. Absolutely. I am interested in that as well. Okay, so we have another voicemail from Allison. And Allison has a case suggestion too. Hi, Jill and Dick. This is Allison. I'm a longtime listener, but it's been a while since I've had a case suggestion for you. I've got one that's a doozy. Who wouldn't be charmed and want to marry a Rockefeller? Um, Sandra Boss was charmed and married Clark Rockefeller in the 90s. Um, and in 2001, they had a daughter. While he stayed at home with the daughter and spent Boss's money, that hurt their marriage. And Boss actually divorced Clark Rockefeller in 2007. But in 2008, during one of his visitations, he kidnapped their daughter and went on the run. While they were looking for him, or while the police were looking for him uh, for kidnapping his daughter, the mystery of who this man actually was deepened. Um, he didn't have a social security number. He had no driver's license, no credit, nothing. Um, finally, he was identified through fingerprints on a glass that a friend had as a German immigrant named Christian Karl, I'm going to butcher this name, I'm sorry, Gerhard Steider, G-E-R-H-A-R-T-S-T-E-I-T-E-R, -E -E for Dick, I know you like that. This man had come to the United States as a teenager and got married and got his green card, but divorced and then changed his name and moved to LA as Christopher Chichester, claiming he was of royal descent, royal English descent. He lived with Dee Dee Sohas in LA. Her son and daughter-in-law, John and Linda Sohas, also lived on the property, but they went missing in 1985. Um, Christopher Chichester went missing shortly after, but uh, skeletal remains of John Sohas was discovered in the backyard of that house in 1994. Christopher Chichester had become Christopher Crow, working on Wall Street. Christopher Crow, as police got close to him for the disappearance of John and Linda, he actually disappeared again and became Clark Rockefeller, who married Sandra. So this guy was 
a chameleon and changed his name and nobody really knew who he was for a very long time. He was arrested as Chip Smith after he kidnapped his daughter and he is now serving a sentence for kidnapping and for the murder of John Sohas. And so I would love to see if you guys could cover this case. There's got a lot of twists and turns to keep straight. Love to see what you do with it. Thank you so much for everything. Thanks, Allison. Yeah, thanks, Allison. Wow, my mind is just spinning. Yeah. <laughs> I, I said when I was listening to Allison's suggestion, I said, I know this case. And yeah, it was very famous. Yeah, I've heard of it. But the detail that she went into, wow. Well, I didn't know there was that much to it. That's just scratching at the surface. Yeah, wow. So I thought it'd be very interesting. Absolutely. We're going to look into that one. Thank you very much. So what have we got? We've got an email here. We have one email from Beth. All right, so here's a case suggestion from Beth. Beth writes, Hi, Jill and Dick. Great podcast, my type of show. Not too much chatter, good chemistry, not graphic, well-researched, nicely executed. <laughs> well, thanks, Beth. Not everybody likes those things, but I do, and that's why it is the way it is, and I'm glad that you appreciate it as well. So she goes on with her case suggestion. I'm writing from St. John, New Brunswick, Canada, with my case suggestion. There was a murder in my city in 2011. The victim, Richard Oland, was a scion of our local Moosehead Brewery, which had been operating for generations. He was a multimillionaire and his son was tried in court twice for his murder. The killing was brutal and remains officially unsolved. It involves police incompetence, adulterous affairs, family dysfunction, wealth, and so much more. It has been widely reported on in Canada so you won't have a shortage of source material. I thought it would tie in so neatly with your theme of brews and mysteries. I'll still be listening whether you cover it or not. Best wishes. Well, thank you, Beth. That is pretty cool, the whole brew and mysteries thing. Yeah. I, I like it. Maybe we'll change the name. Well, not just for that, but I mean, having the case having to do with the brewery is pretty cool. Yeah. Yeah, yeah and this was another one. I mean, we lived in Maine back when this occurred, and I remember the case and what a mess it was. Yeah. So I think, uh, again, this would be something interesting to delve into. All right. Well, there you go, Beth. We're going to look into that one, too. And we really appreciate you writing to us with it. Yeah. Thanks a lot. Absolutely. So thank you, everyone, for listening, for your support, just for everything you do, just for being you. And we'll see you next time at The Quiet End. Saving seats for you guys. Okay. Bye-bye. Happy holidays. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.